Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight in person and on Zoom for this lecture on Port Newark and the origins and container shipping. My name is Melissa Hosek. I'm the adult programming librarian here at the East Brunswick Public Library. We are very excited to partner for this program with the New Jersey Room at the Newark Public Library. So thank you for them for co-sponsoring as well. I'm going to introduce our presenter. Angus Gillespie is a professor of American Studies at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. He's a Fulbright professor and a New York Times bestselling author. His scholarship deals with the design and construction of the built environment, including work such as bridges, roads, canals, dams, buildings, and tunnels, and talking a little bit more about some of his new research today. He's got many books and they're recognized by so many different organizations. He's got so many stories to tell. Without further ado, further ado, Angus, welcome to East Brunswick Public Library. Thank you for coming. Uh, Melissa, thanks for that introduction. Uh, of course, I'm very proud of this recently published book. Um, it goes without saying, but I have an acute sense of awareness that many people helped me along the way. I have a debt of gratitude to Rutgers University, my employer, for giving me a manageable teaching load, which still allows some time to do the research. Uh, I also owe a debt of gratitude to Rutgers Press for being willing to publish these, I don't wanna say obscure topics, but I say topics that are outside the mainstream of mainstream publication. Um, and also to my wife, Rowena, who puts up with me spending nights and weekends slaving over the computer. People often ask, how did this whole thing get started? Briefly, um, I had a course at Rutgers. It was called Maritime Adventure. And we had three field trips, all day field trips. Uh, field trip number one, we went to the Coast Guard station at Sandy Hook. Uh, field trip number two, we went to the Naval Weapons Station at Leonardo. And field trip number three, we went to Port Newark. When I got to Port Newark, I was so excited with all the noise and the confusion and everything going on. I thought, maybe there's a book in here. Uh, so uh, how's the book structured? It's basically a three-part structure. Uh, the first couple of chapters go into the history of Port Newark and Elizabeth Marine Terminal. And the, most of the book, the bulk of the book, describes how things take place today. And then the very last chapter, there's some speculation about the future. I talk about the possibility of automation at the port and automation on the ships. Sometimes people ask me, well, um, what about the creative process did you enjoy the most? Well, to tell the truth, I really enjoyed interviewing people. Uh, it's almost akin to journalism, uh, interviewing the ship captains, interviewing the longshoremen, uh, finding out how things work. Uh, what was most challenging about the book? Well, I got started on this a long time ago, and I wish I'd brought a camera along, because after 9-11, it became illegal to take photographs. This presented a significant challenge. Uh, I did find a workaround finally, but it took time. But what's the takeaway for us as New Jerseyans? I would say, you know, the ports in California get a lot of attention because they've been the biggest ones. But if we're not the biggest, we can take pride. Here's where it all got started. Containerization started right here in New Jersey. And I think that's something we can all take pride in. So I'm gonna show you a number of slides, both to my live audience here uh, and uh, remote. So I start with a picture. We're all familiar with this, stacks of multicolored steel boxes. How did this all get started? That's what I really wanna talk about today. Uh, but before we get too deeply into the history, I wanna give some background about the geography. So if you can take a look at the upper right-hand corner here, um, the way ships come into Port Newark, they start in the lower New York Bay, they pass through the Veranzano Bridge, Staten Island is on the left, <laughs> Brooklyn is on the right, you keep going into upper New York Bay, and finally, you turn left on the Kilven Call, which is very narrow. And then you take a sharp right into Newark Bay 
and you have your choice of either uh, Port Newark or Port Elizabeth. In the bigger part of the picture, you see Newark Bay with your choice. You have the Elizabeth Channel and you have the Port Newark Channel. Uh, the containerization got started in the Port Newark port, but today most of the containerization is in the Elizabeth Marine Terminal. You notice I'm not saying Port Elizabeth. There's a reason for this. The real Port Elizabeth is in Africa. So I try always to get it straight, Elizabeth Marine Terminal. Okay, so uh, before you had Port Newark, it was a beautiful marshland. Uh, and this all got started in the 1910s when the city of New York, uh, the city of Newark began to think about building a channel. Interestingly enough, you would never get away with it today because of environmental protection. But back in 1910, they were happy to do it. So how did they do it? They did it with dredging. And guess what? Dredging continues to this day. It's a continuous process because the mud and the silt always build up. Uh, recently, uh, the dredging is carried out by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, recently, we increased the depth of the channel to 50 feet to accommodate the new larger ships. So here again, you see the diagram. You pass from lower New York Bay to upper New York Bay, hang a left through the very, very narrow Kill Van Call. You go under the Bayonne Bridge and hang a right, and you see Port, uh, Port Newark and Elizabeth Marine Terminal uh, there uh, in pink. Okay, so uh, here's the way Port Newark looks today. It's a very busy place. Uh, there's a bit of containerization, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. Uh, bulk cargoes, for example, uh, orange juice, uh, gypsum, which is the stuff you make wallboard out of, FAPS, foreign air, foreign auto preparation service, where all the imported cars come. There's a lot of other things going on in Port Newark. Uh, Belgian Block, for example, a uh, busy place, yet most of the containerization is to the south in in Elizabeth Marine Terminal. So here it is, you see both Port Newark and Elizabeth Marine Terminal as seen from Bayonne, where there is another terminal. <laughs> okay, uh, so a lot of my book deals with the APM, AP Molar Container Terminal at Port Elizabeth. One of the reasons I chose that, it's kind of a successor to the original sea land, which was Malcolm McLean's baby. So it's kind of Port Newark hyphen Elizabeth Marine Terminal. This is how you see it from the air. Well, how did this all get started? Um, for many years, from about 1910 to about 1948, Port Newark was run by the city of Newark but they had a lot of problems. It was underfinanced. The city of Newark, they had to deal with housing, with streets, with schools, and there just wasn't enough money left over to invest in the seaport, let alone money to invest in the airport. So quietly behind the scenes, uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey started negotiating with the city very delicate because you don't want to offend the pride of the city fathers. But eventually, uh, and the governor sort of stepped in and leaned on the city council. And eventually, wisely, I think, uh, the city of Newark decided to turn it over, the airport and the seaport, to the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Very wise move because now, instead of bleeding the budget, Port Authority was paying rent. And Port Authority had the money to upgrade everything. Very smart move. So the conceptual breakthrough. This all got started in 1956. And the guy who did it was a guy named Malcolm McLean. Uh, to make the long story short, way back in 1937, Malcolm McLean, who was basically a trucker from North Carolina, was driving his truck with a load of cotton 
from Fayetteville, North Carolina to Bayonne, New Jersey. And he falls in line with his truck as they're loading it into the ship at Hoboken. And he's getting very angry and he's getting very frustrated because he's watching the stevedores load the ship box by box, barrel by barrel, crate by crate. And he's saying, why don't we put the whole blankety blank blank, I won't use the bad language, uh, truck onto the blankety blank ship. That was the original idea, but it took some 19 years from 1937 to 1956 before he had accumulated the capital and the wisdom to push ahead with the plan. Everybody hails Malcolm McLean as an innovator. Um, like the slide says, he couldn't afford to go to college. Uh, his parents did have enough money to buy a secondhand truck and he formed a trucking company. Here's a guy, he never went to college, but he was terribly smart and very wise about trucking. He knew all the ins and outs. So what happened about 1952, all the pieces of the puzzle began coming together. And I'll make the long story short. What basically happened is he reached out to all the right people. Um, for example, uh, Keith Tatlinger, who was a chassis expert. And Malcolm McLean explained his plan to put the truck onto the ship. And Tatlinger said, well, why don't you remove the axle and the wheels and the chassis? And McLean said, you can do that? Yeah, I can help you. He was hired. And just incident after incident, that was a breakthrough, but there were many other breakthroughs. For example, he talked to another expert who helped figure out the fittings so you could stack these things one on top of another. He talked to yet another expert, Walter Riston, who was with the First National City Bank, who saw the wisdom of this and put the money in to invest it. Then he had another guy, Charlie Cushing, who figured out how to use surplus World War II leftover ships to convert them into container ships. So all along the way, he figures everything out. And it, it's just amazing how he had the good sense to take advice. So here was the very first container ship. And it's amazing what it was basically is a leftover World War II tanker. And the deal was, what he did is he put sort of a steel superstructure on top of the pumps and the gauges. And he, that was where he was able to stack the container. But the real wisdom of this is he stacked these containers. The ship went from Newark to Houston, Texas with the, with the containers. But then guess what? In Houston, Texas, they filled it up with oil and brought it back to Newark. I mean, it was a win-win situation both ways. Okay, so success. Very important date, the 26th of April, 1956, the first crane loads the first containers onto the first container ship. And you can see the decorative flags there. And it was amazing. One container was loaded every seven minutes, a record at the time. Now, to be honest, there was a problem here because the longshoremen were not happy with this development because you were in effect uh, putting people out of work. In the long run, I think it all worked out because longshoremen are well paid today and they, they operate complicated machinery rather than physically loading boxes and barrels. But at the time, Longshoremen were upset, that's the truth. Okay, Elizabeth Seaport. You know, you see how I keep dancing around not calling it Port Elizabeth. Um, so what happened was the containerization was so very, very successful, the Port Authority got authorization to expand into the next county south into Elizabeth and it's a long story, uh, it's, it's all explained in the book, but 
this was amazing piece of work. Uh, the guy that I interviewed, Ron Kadams, was a civil engineer, and he was an amazing guy. I asked him, well, how did you design? There was no precedent here. He said, I started with a piece of paper. Very smart guy. And this port, container port in Elizabeth Marine Terminal became the template for container ports all over the world. So here is the way it was set up, the Elizabeth Channel. And notice the slide, it's complicated. Port Newark is in Essex County. Elizabeth Marine Terminal is in Union County. I uh, thank goodness the two counties work together under state supervision and it goes very smoothly. What happened over time is most of the containerization you find in the Elizabeth Marine Terminal these days. Uh, this, that's not the whole story, but that's the main story. Okay, so the big problem with any container port is you don't want those boxes lingering around too long. You wanna get them out so you can get new, con new containers in. And there's basically two or three ways to move these containers. One way is through drayage trucking, which is a short-term thing. You move the container from the port to a nearby warehouse. That's specialized drayage trucking. The other thing is long distance trucking. And I, different experts have given me different numbers, but basically if it's between say 300 and 500 miles, it makes sense to send it by truck. Beyond 500 miles, it makes sense to send it by railroad. Okay, and these railroads, they're so amazing. Look at the slide, they stack on the railroad cars, not one, but two containers. It's very efficient. And no wonder there was all this hullabaloo recently about the railroad strike, because if the railroads had gone on strike, uh, we would all be up the creek. Okay, so uh, another big chapter in the book has to do with navigation. And I'll give you the simplified version this evening. Um, the way it works is, when ships come from overseas, they're very dependent on something called the Ambrose Channel. You can't just come in any which way, you gotta stick to this channel because the channel is the place that's been dredged. And to do that, you have to have experts to help you. Say you're a ship captain, you come from France. You can't, you can't be expected to know all the ins and outs of the Ambrose Channel. And therefore, you have to depend on a number of people. The first person you have to depend on is the Sandy Hook pilot who brings you in approximately as far as the Veronzano Bridge, the lower New York Bay. Then the Sandy Hook pilot hands it off to the harbor pilot who's responsible for the actual docking. And he is assisted with a team of tugboats. It's all very complicated and requires a good deal of specialized training. Okay, here is a more, uh, complicated diagram, bear with me. You come in uh, from lower New York Bay to upper New York Bay, sticking strictly in the Ambrose Channel. Uh, you hang a left at the Kill Van Call, which is extremely narrow. You pass underneath the Ambrose Bridge and you hang a right into New York Bay. That's the way it's done. And you're very dependent at this stage on your harbor pilot, who's assisted with the teamwork of tugboats. Now, when you're coming from overseas and you first approach New York Harbor, uh, the first thing you see, or the first thing you used to see, was a light ship marking the beginning of the Ambrose Channel. And this was the way it was done for years and years and years. You have this Ambrose light ship. But there was a big problem. All too often, the foreign ships coming in, maybe they weren't paying enough attention. Maybe they set the ship on autopilot. There were many collisions. These ships kept running in to the light ships and it was very dangerous duty. So gradually, 
this was a later version of the light ship. It's now available at the South Street Seaport. But in any event, they replaced the light ship with this Texas Tower. And they thought that that would solve the problem. Guess what? The ships kept running into the darn tower. I mean, collision after collision. After, actually, it, it's called elision because you're running into a fixed object. So finally, they said, forget about the light ship. Forget about the Texas Tower. We'll just put a buoy out there. And so that was the place that the Sandy Hook pilot gets on board. So I want to give you just a brief tour of as you're coming up lower New York Bay, you see a number of landmarks. And I want to mention a few because they're so important. Even today, my friends, the pilots tell me, yeah, we got GPS. Yeah, we got electronics. Uh, but it's still reassuring to see those landmarks along the way. And the first landmark is the Navisig Twin Lights. Take a close look at the picture. These are twin lights, but they're fraternal twins, not identical twins. Notice the one on the left is square. The one on the right is octagonal. You see that? And so they're, they're not identical. And it's very important for a number of reasons. These were among the first lighthouses to use the Fresnel lens. They're very important because this was where Marconi sent the first telegraph. Uh, historically very valuable and worth a tour. As you move along, uh, the next important landmark is Fort Hancock, um, which we see there uh, at Sandy Hook. Uh, this used to be very important right up to World War II. Uh, the U.S. Army had artillery, and nowadays uh, we don't need that anymore because we're worried more about airplanes. Um, but it was important in its day. Sandy Hook Lighthouse, amazing story, designed and built 1764, and it's still there. Amazing, very picturesque, lovely. The Romer Shoal Lighthouse. This is a so-called spark plug lighthouse, still in New Lower New York Bay, uh, just north of Sandy Hook, uh, very close to the border with New York. And it, it's in the National Register of Historic Places. Next, oh dear, the old Orchard Shoal Lighthouse, totally wiped out by Hurricane Sandy. I've been in long communication with the National Lighthouse Museum in Staten Island. There were plans to rebuild it, maybe if not on site, maybe at the National Lighthouse Museum, but the budget to do so is about $35 million. So far, we've had no luck in raising that kind of money. Next, we have the West Bank Light. Um, and uh, this is still in lower New York Bay. It's currently active. It's lit up, but it is not manned anymore. It's automated. But the Coast Guard comes by from time to time to check on it. This one you might miss because Coney Island is so built up. It's surrounded by houses, but it's over there on the starboard side as you're coming up into the port. Baranzano Narrow Bridge. This is a big landmark because this is often considered the place where lower New York Bay gives way to upper New York Bay. And it's the place typically where the Sandy Hook pilot hands it off to the harbor pilot. Fort Wadsworth, there on the port side, just after you pass the Baranzano Bridge, an old army fort. We don't need it as an army fort anymore. However, it is headquarters for the local New York chapter of the Coast Guard. And then over on the starboard side, you have Fort Hamilton, which has a very interesting history. It was pretty much unsuccessful in defending New York City uh, from the British attack. And after the War of 1812, Congress really beefed up coastal fortifications. We continue north and we pass the Staten Island Ferry on the port side. Um, this goes back and forth, and it's right next door to the National Lighthouse Museum. 
I, actually, I took this photo from the Lighthouse Museum. Okay, and we get to Robin's Reef, and we're right up there in Upper New York Bay. This pretty much marks the point where you're going to turn left into the Kill Van Call. Now, <sighs> Kate Walker, she was the keeper of the Robins Reef Lighthouse. And it's a fascinating story. Uh, she's German American. And after the death of her husband, she took over running the lighthouse. And she was a petite woman, but records show she rescued something like 24 seafarers who might have drowned without her help. She's a hero, or should I say heroine. And as a result, the Coast Guard has named an important buoy tender after the Catherine Walker. And this is the actual buoy tender that services the buoys in Greater New York Harbor. WLM 552, named for Catherine Walker. Well, in addition to maintaining the buoys, another service of the of the Coast Guard is called Vessel Traffic Service. This is a little bit like air traffic control at the airports, but there's some significant differences. Airplanes move very fast. You have to make split second decisions and the air traffic control gives direct orders to the pilots. Vessel Traffic Service, it's more advisory. Uh, they communicate not so much with the ship captains, but with the harbor pilots. And the harbor pilots, they know what they're doing. And they're familiar with the local conditions of the wind and the tide and the waves and the clouds. And so vessel traffic service communicates with the pilots and advises them of the best course of action, but very rarely issues direct orders. They can do it but they do it with great restraint. And I've, I've been there uh, at Fort Wadsworth and I watched them do it. It's complicated. Uh, for example, in the channels uh, of Port Newark and Elizabeth Marine Terminal, if you have ships coming and going, you have to coordinate the movements, particularly if there's an oil barge loading and that makes it even more narrow than ever. So there's communication going on. The Kill Van Call. It's a remarkable piece of water. Um, it's interesting. One of the reasons we have ports is that they're inland where the waves are stable. At the Kill Van Call, it's very narrow. It's three miles long. It's only a thousand feet wide. Here's where vessel traffic service often comes in. They say, you should wait, let this guy go. You should go, let this guy wait and so forth. Because sometimes it's very difficult to have two ships passing each other in the Kill Van Call, particularly in their company by tugboats. So Robins Reef marks the eastern end and Bergen Point, the western end where you have the Bayonne Bridge, which by the way, was recently raised. Okay, so what do we see uh, along the southern part of the Kill Van Call in Staten Island? This is worth a visit, the, the Sailor's Snug Harbor. This was originally a kind of a retirement home for seafarers. And it was done by a, a wealthy shipbuilder who had a sense of social responsibility. And it was very successful for, for a long time. However, with Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal in the 1930s, it, with social security, it was no longer really needed for a retirement home for sailors. And so today it's a series of museums, all, all worth a visit. Here's more on Sailor Snug Harbor. Operated in 1833, but it became pretty much a cultural center after uh, 1976. Another interesting place along the south side of Kilvan Call is the Cadell Dry Dock. Uh, I had the good fortune of 
making a tour there with the National Maritime Historical Society, because ordinarily they don't allow visitors in. There's too much going on and it's too dangerous, but very, very fascinating place. <laughs> no smoking, no visitors, no nothing. Uh, but I had the lucky break to see it. And this gives you in the slide some idea of what they do. They do dry docking, um, they do welding, they do electrical, machine shop, carpentry. They fix the ships, basically. Here is an example of the uh, tugboat in the dry dock. This was the uh, Brian McAllister, actually, uh, being fixed up. And here's the Bayonne Bridge, which we discussed, which has recently been raised to allow the new uh, container ships to be able to pass. Once they pass, they can enter Newark Bay where they have a choice of Port Newark or Elizabeth Marine Terminal. So far, when I was doing the research, um, I was told that uh, Port Newark and Elizabeth Marine Terminal were the third largest in the US after the two big ports in California. But just last week, uh, Beth Ann Rooney from the Port Authority corrected me, said, watch the statistics. We, at the end of 2022, it may turn out that we were number one. So I'm, I'm keeping my, my fingers crossed. Uh, we'll see what happens. So the Sandy Hook pilots, um, these are amazing guys, um, licensed marine pilots. Uh, they're the ones that meet the ships at the Ambrose buoy. Um, sometimes my students ask me, well, uh, how do you get to be uh, a Sandy Hook pilot? because I hear this pay is very good. Well, yeah, the pay is good, uh, but here's the deal. Uh, you have to be a college graduate, and then you have to agree to a 14-year apprenticeship, and you have to memorize the charts. So if you're game for a 14-year apprenticeship, have at it, uh, but it's very tricky because you really got, memorizing those charts, I've looked at it. I've looked at the Coast Guard exams. I don't think I could do it. It's just mind boggling. All these buoys, each buoy has a number and there's so many of them and they give you a blank map and you've got to fill it out. More power to them. Okay, approximately at the Baranzano Bridge, uh, the, <laughs> The Sandy Hook pilots turn it over to the harbor pilots. And the harbor pilots are responsible with tugboats to get the ship into the dock. Uh, this particular harbor pilot, uh, Simon Zorovich, I, I asked him, uh, how do you get the captain to trust you? He said, gray hair helps. Another tricky thing, it's very interesting, when the pilot comes on board the ship, he requests to take over the con from the captain and the captain generally agrees, but legally the captain is still responsible. So you bet the captain keeps a sharp eye on what the pilot is doing. In the event that the captain disagrees with the pilot's judgment, the captain can overrule the pilot. But in practice, that almost never happens. Another thing, this is worth a whole chapter in my book, and I can only give you a brief introduction, but the deal is that most of the seafarers who come into Port Newark, Elizabeth Marine Terminal, they come from overseas. Many of them come from third world countries, and it's a tough life. It's lonely. It's hardship. They miss their family. They miss their children's birthdays. Uh, they miss family get-togethers. It's, it's a very hard life. And the chaplains are trained to listen sympathetically to their concerns, whether it's a family problem or a financial problem. And they can do religious things like Holy Communion if they ask, but they don't proselytize. Uh, and one of the things that they're doing recently, which is kind of interesting, is 
a program called Shopping at Sea because when COVID came along, many of these seafarers, they're not allowed off the damn ship. And, and so they're confined. They used, I, I used to work with Siemens Church Institute. We took them to the, to the shopping malls. Can't do that anymore. So what we're doing now with Siemens Church Institute, when they're two weeks out at sea, they send us a request for what they want, medicines or food or computer gear. And then we shop for it and we bring it to the ship. And then they, they reimburse us for what we laid out. And they're thrilled to have somebody paying attention to them. <laughs> These com these containers are so complicated. Take a look at the slide. Is it flammable? Is it poison? Is it an oxidizer? Is it explosive? Is it an inhalation hazard? Depending on the placard, that determines where you place the container in the ship. And it's all computerized and it's very complicated. For example, if it's very heavy, it should be put at the bottom of the ship for stability. If it's flammable, it should be put on top so the firefighters can get at it and on and on and on. Very complicated. <laughs> Here are just a few of the complications. You wanna minimize the number of container moves. Cold boxes need electricity. You have to guard the vessel while all this is going on. Heavy boxes go down low, flammables up high. Every box has a, and certain chemicals, you can't put them side by side because it'll cause an explosion. Thank goodness it's a computer assisted and it's very complex. I should also point out that with these cranes, they can simultaneously load and unload the ship at the same time. Very complicated work done by longshoremen. In order to get access after 9-11 to the port, you need a TWIT card, Transportation Worker Identification Credential. Um, you have to go to the center, you have to fill out the form. They have to be convinced you're not a threat. You have to pay $129. And of course I had to do it because I, I had to get access to the port. When these trucks come in to the port, they have these RFID, radio frequency identification tags, because that communicates rapidly to the clerk if they're here to drop off, to pick up where they should go, because you wanna minimize the number of truck moves in the port and expedite getting rid of these containers which clog up the port. To maintain law and order, in the port, you have the Port Authority Police. They have a long list of responsibilities, including counterterrorism, uh, commercial vehicle inspection. One interesting thing about the Port Authority Police, they're cross-trained as firefighters. So they do that as well. Here's the gate complex. It's very um, sophisticated. The RFID tells the clerk what has to happen, and the clerk directs the truck to the appropriate spot. One of the problems has, in the past has always been the truckers hate too much waiting time, which is understandable. Uh, and the ports are doing their best to get around that, but it's not easy. The cranes can load and unload at the same time. What happens when the container is loaded off the ship it's put onto what's called a bomb cart. The bomb cart, it's not fixed. It has sides, so you can just drop it in. It's very quick. And then the longshoremen take it to a place where it can be stacked up. These longshoremen drive something called the hustler truck. It's specially adapted for use in the port. It's not authorized for highways. Then once the hustler truck pulling the bomb cart gets to the yard, the straddle carrier is able to load them up. In the old days, you just loaded them one by one on the surface, but we're running out of room. We have to stack them these days. It's very important for the stacking. It's all computerized. You want the ones that have to leave the port first on top of the stack. 
and the ones leaving the port later at the bottom of the stack. If you screw that up, you're going to waste a lot of time shuffling it. Here's the way these rubber tired straddle carriers stack the containers. It's, it's very sophisticated work and it's done by longshoremen. U.S. Customs and Border Patrol um, try to maintain law enforcement. One of the things they're looking for is fakes, fake pocketbooks, fake sneakers. Uh, that's one of their sore points. But they can't inspect them all. So what they do is they use computers and good judgment, and they only flag the suspicious containers. So the trucks are loaded. Presumably, they're go only going to go about three to 500 miles. Now, some of the trucks only go a short distance. They go to local warehouses. And this is called drayage trucking, and it's highly specialized. So you put them on the chassis, and they're on their way. And it's called intermodal because it can go from ship to truck to train interchangeably. So you can load it either onto a truck or onto a train. And you stack them two by two. I'm sure you've read about in the newspaper all these global supply chain problems. We don't have time this evening to go into all, but basically we really got swamped during the COVID because people were staying at home and they were going on their computers and they were going to Amazon and they were ordering stuff and the whole system pretty much got swamped. We're beginning to dig out now. So um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I did bring along a few books um, and they're uh, available for purchase. And we have a special this evening. Um, the, the regular price is $33.95, but tonight only, oops, I'm selling them for 20, oops, 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 $20. <laughs> and, and I'll even throw in a copy of the Twin Towers book. Okay, so I think we're ready for uh, questions. We can start with the live audience. Any questions? No, oh, no question. Okay, we can go to a remote people. Uh, Melissa, do you have some questions? Um, I don't yet. Um, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat and I will relay them to Angus, okay? So you might wanna chat a little bit and then we'll see if any questions come in. Okay. One of the problems that I had with this book was coming up with a suitable title because I said Port Newark and the origins of container shipping. Ideally, I would like to say Port Newark and Port Elizabeth, but then it gets so wordy, it's impossible. Uh, and in addition, most of the ship captains refer to it as Port Newark regardless of whether they're going to Elizabeth or Newark. The other thing I've noticed, uh, talking to ship captains from Germany or from France, is they often say, I've seen it in the wardroom, they say, we're going to New York. Uh, they don't make a distinction between New York and New Jersey, uh, because traditionally this is a New York market. Um, and I guess we have a question too, once you're done. Okay. No, finish your thought. I just want to let you know that we are getting some oh, questions. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, there's a long story about the competition between New York and New Jersey. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, you might say New Jersey won the war on containerization is, is the streets of New York are so small and congested, there just wasn't room. You need acres and acres to spread these containers out. And that's where New Jersey uh, uh, came ahead. New York did fine back in the days of box by box, barrel by barrel, but once containers, you need acres and acres of space, and New Jersey had it, and New York didn't. And the other important thing is, New Jersey is on the mainland, 
and has ready access to interstate highways and to railroads. So New Jersey had some built-in advantages. Uh, but that, that completes my thought. I'm ready to take questions. The question is, do containers go into the hold or just onto the deck? The answer is both. And that was a big breakthrough because in the early days of break bulk, box by box, barrel by barrel, you put everything into the hold of the ship. But now with containerization, you put the initial load into the hold of the ship, but then you can start stacking them up on the deck. And the reason you can do this is that the containers are hermetically sealed. They're weatherproof. So you can stack them up on the deck. Um, it's, it's a big breakthrough. It, it, in effect, it doubles the capacity. You still have to be careful to, to balance the weight, but yes, you can stack them up on the deck. And, and that, greatly increases your workload, your, your capacity. So I have another question. There seem to be so many containers stacked four to five high in Sayreville, New Jersey. Is there a future use for them? <laughs> yes. Um, why do we have so many containers stacked up in Sayreville? Why do we have so many containers stacked up here, there, and elsewhere? Here's the problem. We in the United States, we're a consumer nation. We buy stuff and we are importing televisions and computers and handbags and footwear and furniture and automobiles. We are consumers and we import stuff. And if you talk to port executives, what are we exporting? Scrap iron and scrap paper, whatever's left over. We are not exporting much of value. Uh, and so there's a problem. We import lots and lots and we export very little. So guess what? We're, we end up with a lot of empty containers. Yes, there are possible uses for containers. Uh, architects are particularly interested in adapting them for housing because they're very well built. Uh, as we've just discussed. And so potentially uh, they can be used not only for housing, but for sheds. Uh, but uh, we haven't done enough of that. We keep, we keep accumulating more and more containers. Yeah, I've seen some very interesting uses of the containers to actually build homes and yeah. stacking them. And it's, it's really the sky's the limit. It's a cube. So, you know, not really a cube, but a very gigantic 3D rectangle. So. Another question. After a container has been used for storing hazardous chemicals, how do we make sure they will not be used for storing consumables, food, or you know that being passed on to any future products inside? That's a good question. I'm not sure I have the answer. I think once, once the container is marked for hazardous chemicals, you're, you're not really allowed to start using it for food, uh, that, that, that the computers are tracking the uses of these containers. Okay, and then we have another question. Was the ever given blocking the Suez last year just built too big or was there a pilot error to blame? So I'm guessing comparing this to some of the other stuff. So they wanna know what you think about that. The blocking of the Suez Canal yeah, the, is, was he ever giving too big, possibly? Now, I could be wrong, but my memory was that there was a gust of wind that threw the ship off the course. Uh, I would have to double check that. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I really don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. I don't think it was pilot error. I think it was a gust of wind, but I could be wrong. There's so many variables when you were explaining all the steps and checks that have to go into this process. So I'm yeah. sure there, there, there are lots of options and it, you yeah. ne may never fully know. Yeah. Trying to see if there's any other questions, please place them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'm going to thank you, Angus, so much for your time and coming and sharing all of your books that you've done and telling stories about New Jersey and New Jersey history. I want to thank the New Jersey Room at the Newark Public Library again for co-sponsoring with us.
And so, yeah, so I'm going to end the Zoom portion now. If other people want to speak with Angus in the room, feel free to. But everyone, be safe and be well and have a good night. Thank you.